Coming to you from the greatest city in the world, it's the season finale of Ventriloquism Weekly. Wow. And I mean wow. Matt Bailey here, and I just got off the phone with John Max, writer for all 22 years of Jay Leno's Tonight Show. And he's the author of the new book, Monologue, What Makes America Laugh Before Bed. And during our talk, we really get into it about comedy late night and comedy on late night. But I promise you, it is valuable for all. We really get in. What's a joke? What's a good joke? How do you find a joke? How do you write a joke? How do you pick a joke? It's all there. It is all there. Now, Max has a resume unlike any other. He's written jokes for almost every celebrity you can imagine. Steve Martin, Billy Crystal, and our very own Terry Fader are just some of the names mentioned in our chat. He's also written for numerous award shows, the Academy Awards, Golden Globes, Emmys, you name it, he's written for it. Yet, he began his career as a lawyer in political consulting. Now, I know there's a joke in there somewhere, but I bet he can find about 100 jokes. Here now, our interview with seven-time Emmy Award-nominated writer, John Max. John Max, welcome to Ventriloquism Weekly. How are you today, sir? Doing great, Mac. Doing great. Oh, this is an honor to have you. Seven-time Emmy Award nominee, Tonight Show writer, uh, storied career that you chronicle in your new book, Monologue, What Makes America Laugh Before Bed. And I just want to ask right off the bat, why did you decide to write the book? You know, it, man, it felt like time in, in this sense. I've been at the Tonight Show for 22 years. Uh, I had a lot of stories and kind of, you know, it made me think, looking back, what impact has Jay and The Tonight Show had, you know, which led to what impact have all these late night shows had. And, you know, I knew that there was going to be a lot of other changes coming in late night over the next year or so, which obviously are coming right now. Mm-hmm. So the idea was, you know, the timing was right. It was a good way to get some stories. That's fantastic. Now let's talk about your beginnings in writing. Uh, you didn't really, you began as the total antithesis of a writer. You'd always been a writer, but you actually went to law school and were, uh, you talk about this in the book, you did some stuff in politics before jumping in and being a writer full time. Yeah, I went to law school with the full intent of never practicing law. Uh, <laughs> you, know, you know, which is a good thing, although my mother still says, you know, it's something to fall back on. Yeah. Um, and, you know, what happened is I was, uh, while I was in law school, I was running a political campaign. I just continued to do that. Uh, won my first two, lost my next 23. Uh, wasn't in too great shape. Uh, then ended up hitting one, won a governor of Pennsylvania's race, moved to Washington, D.C. Did a lot of campaigns across the country, the TV ad, the debate prep speeches. And um, then after, uh, you know, six years of doing that at a, at a pretty high level, I just got tired of I was flying 200 nights a year. I had three kids, uh, at least three that I knew of, could be four. <laughs> and, you know, so it was, uh, I, you know, I sent some jokes into Jay Leno, and he uh, he started to use them, and he gave me a call and when he was taking on the Tonight Show and said, uh, yeah, why don't you come on out for a few weeks? So <laughs> I I came out for the 13 weeks, you know, I had a 13-week deal. I told my partners, I'll be back. Uh, and that was 23 years ago. That's great. That's great. Now, what prompted you? You mentioned this a little bit in the book. Can you can you talk more about what prompted you to just start sending Jay Leno jokes to to use? Right. It, it, it is a great question. The I had done a campaign for a U.S. senator named Paul Simon from Illinois, mm-hmm. and uh, what we do is in Washington, there's a series of speeches where you're supposed to be funny. The Alfalfa speech, the gridiron speech, and Paul was doing the gridiron, which is, you know, they have someone from each party make funny remarks in front of reporters who put on sketches and skits. And Paul said, John, you're funny. Why don't you write some jokes? So I did, um, and they apparently went pretty well. And uh, the uh, Frank Mankiewicz, who had put the speech together for Paul, called me and said, you're pretty good at this. And uh, I thought that just might be a nice way of saying I was a really lousy political consultant. <laughs> but 
uh, I saw that Jay uh, was buying jokes from freelancers. He was guest hosting for Johnny Carson. Mm-hmm. So I figured, you know, I always like to write jokes. So let me tr- let me try it. So I started sending them in, and he started using them, and that's what led me to where I am. That's incredible. That's just wonderful. Now it takes talent, and you certainly are a talented writer. We're going to touch on all the people that you that you uh, have uh, put jokes together for, and um, I just want to ask, where do you find the stamina? Because the stamina that that's incredible. We were talking on the phone the other day. A hundred jokes a day, even more. You know, five hundred thousand uh, jokes that you say in the book uh, in a, in the twenty two years that you did the Tonight Show. Where does that stamina come from? Uh, three really greedy children and a wife who's spending me into an early grave. Uh, <laughs> that that that's of course the first thing. Now yeah. you know what it is is I I think that you know you you know different writers write different styles. Mm-hmm. There were writers on the Tonight Show who wrote like thirty jokes a day, and they were all beauties. Uh, for me to get to what I wanted. Uh, my process was take a topic, start a joke, and almost just see. It was A to let to B to let to C to let to D, and sometimes joke E was the best one. Right. Um, you know, but it was you know it's 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 stamina is a good word. Discipline might be the other. Hmm. Uh, there's a lot of people out there who who want to write and just don't have the discipline to sit down and, and I call it start typing. Mm-hmm. So every morning, you know, I get up at six thirty. I, I check the website. I see what was the news. I read a paper. To get my ideas of what's going on in the world, I get to work. I write down nine topics for the day, completely arbitrary number, man, just to give me a a start. Yeah. And then I would kind of do association jokes, you know, A connects to B, do those. Then you go to the small stories. <clears throat> Excuse me, like you know, I call them a man in Belgium story. Yeah. You know, you find a weird oddball story from from some faraway place, and you use that as your setup. Uh, but sometimes in those, the setup's funnier than the premise, than the uh, actual joke. Um, and do those, and you know, by the time you're done, you see you've hit 100 jokes. And I just want to point out one thing: I wrote 500,000 jokes. 482,000 are in a landfill somewhere. They just they got read and thrown out. So let's put it in perspective. All, yeah. most get unused. Yeah, but it's still it's still incredible, and it's an incredible ratio because of what has to the amount of of volume every day for Jay's monologue that has to just get get kind of whittled down into what the monologue will be. And it was, it was very sort of, um, um, I want to say competitive, but that may be too negative. You talk about you know, really wanting to make sure you get a joke in as, as often as you can. What, uh, what were the ingredients of, of jokes that sort of found their way into Jay's monologue that you did? You know, I think what happened is, you know, with all comics, you have to, to hit their voice. Um, and I think that, you know, by, you know, after 22 years, I think I've got Jay's voice in perspective. Yeah. Um, again, in the end, he would always take and mold them. We collectively probably wrote about a thousand jokes a day. Mm-hmm. Uh, he would read them. He'd winnow those down to about a hundred that he'd be considering. And then he and the head writer, Jack Cohen, would sit down and narrow it down to the 25 or 30 that would make the monologue. Of those remaining 70 that had been considered, maybe 10 or 15 might carryovers for the next day, and then you start again. What made it is, what made it in, you know, obviously he had to think it's funny, but it was, you know, he would always hit, what are the biggest topics in the news? What are people talking about? They had a great love of politics and politicians and finding them funny, so anything like that. Celebrities, sports, then you get the small, like I said, the small oddball stories. We always like to do those, you know, what I call the the, the informative joke. You know, a study says that, you know, 90% of, of babies are conceived in July, you know, or whatever it may be, and then you just work backwards and, and explain how that happens. Well, sure, the NBA and Congress are in recess then. You know what I mean? So you get your, you get your joke off of that. Yeah, that's, that's awesome. Now, how much of what went into what Jay liked to do, the politics and, and topics about things that weren't necessary, po- necessarily political but went to Jay's sensibility, informed what you write. I guess what I'm asking is, is there something you didn't, that you really wanted to write, but because you knew Jay just wouldn't go for it, you didn't really bother with it when you were uh, looking I, for I, your articles? It, it would never be on a political agenda or anything like that, because with Jay it was, you know, if there was anything, it was a three-part thing. Mm-hmm. One is what's stupid about this situation. You know who did or said something stupid. Second is, are they a big enough person? Uh, 
you know, and third, of course, was it funny? But we would never write anything. I mean, Jay would never take uh, tell us uh, an ethnic stereotype or a racial joke or anything like right. that. That's, that's not his style of humor. So those would be the only ones that no one would write because it, it'd be, it would be, you know, it would be just a waste of time. He's not going to do it, and you're just wasting your time. Um, but in terms of politics, no one would go in there and say, well, these days did three jokes about Bill Clinton yesterday. We better do two about, you know, uh, George Bush. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, you just write off of what's funny and what's in the news and what's topical, and then you let him, because he's seen the overview, pick and choose what works best. That's great. And when you write for Jay, obviously you got to tap into that. What's it like writing for other people? Sometimes when guests would come on the show, you talk about in the book, uh, Arnold, when he announced, you wrote some lines, and uh, Marty Short, all these different people that you've, you've wrote for over the, over the years. How do you yeah. distinguish? Uh, you know, what happens is, you know, it's... Excuse me. It's always hard to write for somebody who you literally don't know for their voice. Mm-hmm. But, you know, I've I've been lucky enough to write for you know Billy Crystal and Chris Rock. Excuse me, Steve Martin, Marty Short. And what you do is I would always try to actually talk to them on the phone first. Just spend five minutes, see what's going on in their lives. Yeah. Literally get their voice, and then you kind of move to the you know well, what do you want to talk about when you go do the uh, your act in you know the Kravis Center in Palm Beach. Yeah. Well, you know, let's let's talk about Florida a little bit. You know what I mean? And you get that sense, and then you write, you know, a joke that Chris Rock does. The topics may be the same, but the punchlines, the inflection, the point of view are going to be different. And that's just something you got you have to know. You don't write when you're a writer. Don't write in your voice. Write in theirs. Yeah. And that leads into because you know we have a lot of this is ventriloquism weekly, so we have a lot of entertainers of all of all sorts that listen in. Um, the the thing that the debate that kind of rages in all entertainment, I think, is the comedy is property. And one thing you talk about in the book that is so interesting to me uh, is that writers in the same building, not communicating with each other, would write the same joke. But yeah, it, a different it, it, version of it would show up in the monologue, whoever wrote it the most succinctly or whatever. What right, are your or thoughts? Jay would take it and yeah. change, or Jay could take it and change it, put in his own words. Mm-hmm. Yeah, what are your thoughts when somebody says, oh, that joke was my, that joke's mine, I came up with it. Oh, well, no, I came up with it independently. How do you determine the proprietary aspect of a joke? Uh, you know, what, again, the way we looked at it with Jay was all jokes are his. Mm-hmm. So that you know, if there's 18 writers and, and and eight of us are working on the monologue, and five of us do the same joke about uh, the tanning bomb, if you remember that story, or five of us do the same joke about Hillary erasing her emails, yeah. you know, it's it's more of a you know, again in the end, since he, you know, there's for whatever account that they did at the at the uh, at the show, they know whose it actually was. But you're looking for, you know, exact wording. I call it sometimes putting in a writer's DNA. Yeah. There might be a particular phrase. Uh, I, I was always big with uh, this just in <laughs> to open up a joke, uh, <laughs> yeah, you know, it. making it seem much more important than it was. So sometimes, if, you know, if you would say that in, you go, well, yeah, that was probably. But in the end, you know, there was, it was a very non-competitive group because Jay was always such an easygoing guy. He was never one to say, guys, come on, do better, or anything like that. So that made it really easy in terms of that. There was not any, you know, you know, you hear about stories about Saturday Night Live and cutthroat internal politics. Um, never on with us with Jay. Can internal politics be a danger to the comedy? Uh, I think so, because I, uh, I think for two reasons. You know, one reason you can say, well, it sharpens it when you're fighting for the best joke. But what I think happens is that oftentimes the loudest voice in the room wins, and the loudest voice in the room may not be the best writer. The best writer is the one who constructs the best joke or has the best angle. So I think that an inordinate amount of time is spent um, at some shows, you know, fighting to see who gets what in, and they don't have the best joke. Um, Chris Rock told me uh, recently, I said, you know what we've got? I said, what do you mean? He goes, we've got jokes. So what do you mean? He goes, wherever we go, he means he, he was nice enough to use a plural. He goes, you know, we've got jokes. We come in there for any time he does an act. He's got, you know, 50 more jokes prepared, another eight minutes more prepared than anyone else on the bill. So the, he knows that, that he's got the selection. The second part of what Chris says is, you know, it's easy to write a joke sometimes. Picking jokes is hard. 
And that's where the true, the true great ones come in. Because a lot of different people are going to have the same joke or the same basic concept, but it's the ones who know how they flow, how they should flow in the order, uh, what's the best one of the three jokes on a particular topic. Uh, that's, that's the true genius that's out there. That's, yeah. So how would Jay, what do you think Jay's thought process was when picking that monologue? Uh, I, you know, the first part was, again, you know, I think he did it, you know, the first weeding out is, did it make me laugh? Mm -hmm. Um, you know, you know, as you read, I mean, you don't, you know, again, a lot of comics, they laugh inside. You know, I mean, uh, so the first one is, did it make him laugh? The second concept, and again, this is trying to, you know, you know, looking into the room and, 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 you know, trying to guess what's going on, you know, as he's going through all those file cards. And I think the second thing is, you know, in addition to, did it make me laugh is, um, is it something unique? Is it a unique take? When you're doing that many jokes and that many shows, sure, you're going to take the easy, what I call the easy layups. You're going to take the easy joke. You know, you're going to do, you know, the, the one that, that's a little obvious because it has to be, you know. Mm -hmm. But it's what's the second and third joke at the top? What's a unique twist? What's something that people could think of? What, you know, with Jay's perspective, it's always what is stupid about this that we will all agree on is stupid? Mm -hmm. And how do you do that? And then third is, the question is, okay, do we, you know, again, a, a big news story breaks. Uh, let's just take, for example, uh, you know, Barack Obama blows off uh, some event to go play golf, you yeah. know, and, it, and everyone's jumping on it. Um, you're not going to do eight jokes on it. You're going to do two. So what are the best two out of that? What are the ones that, you know, can, and maybe, you know, you look at saying one that goes, what is one that is, you know, a, a, a joke that fits just within Obama, the second, what can be taken to somewhere else? You know, again, he had trouble playing golf the other day. He got caught in the sand trap. You know, because of bullshit, I call that a rack. You know what <laughs> I mean? So you're taking it to another level. Yeah, that's, that's great. Now, you uh, also write for a friend of ours, Terry Fader. And when the you write. Great for Terry Fader. I am, I am so lucky. Uh, I got a call. I had a question about I'll launch into a story. Uh, Terry had uh, was looking for a writer a few years ago because he was he wanted to add some things to his act in Las Vegas, and I I had seen him on America's Got Talent. I knew he was at the headliner at the Mirage, mm -hmm. and you know I knew he you know has just an incredible and unique talent. And I got the call, and they said, "Would you like to meet Terry?" So I flew to Vegas, and we had dinner. And the deal was that we were going to, he was introducing a new puppet, a new character. And, you know, could we bounce some ideas back and forth? And so I went over his house the next day. And what we did basically is it wasn't, our writing sessions are different from others. With other people, I just send in jokes a lot of times. With Terry, it's an actual conversation. Where does the character come from? You know, what would he do? What, how would, what is his role in the show? And it, it would be what I call conversation and typing. Mm -hmm. uh, I have this ability to type without looking at the, the, the laptop, which means it's all gibberish a lot of times. <laughs> but, you know, we would do that, and we actually finished the character, and we just kept going and kind of rewrote the whole show, and I've been with him for four years. That's, that's fantastic. Yeah, there, were, there was something at Van Haven, and you were in the video. He came, did a writing workshop, and it was just a, a thrown-together video that showed your writing session for this alien puppet that Steve Axtell had um, sent him to do for this writing session. So that was very, very interesting to see. Do you prefer one method over the other, the collaboration sitting on the sofa or the lock myself in the room and let me write a hundred jokes? Uh, you know, every, everybody's different. Um, you know, it, it's, and I, you know, I go with, like I said, it's all about the talent. It's all not, not mine, the stars. Mm -hmm. So Terry is a back and forth, you know, let's, let's just talk this out and kind of type it up as we go. Others say, just send me the jokes. I'll pick. Uh, others are, send me the jokes and let's get the phone and go over them. Others are, send me the jokes, I'll put you my takes, and then you add to that. And, you know, what you just have to do is you just have to make that decision that, you know, you're going to, you, you kind of just feel it out. I don't really prefer one over the other. The only thing I'm not good at, I'm not good at, I'm not good at, not good at many things, but one thing I, I don't like doing is when somebody, you know, you sit in a room and somebody says, well, just pitch a joke. Uh, no, I'm more of a, let's, let me type it, construct it. You mm -hmm. know, Terry is lucky because it's conversational, uh, as opposed to shine the spotlight on me and I'm the train monkey throwing out a joke. Mm -hmm. uh, I'd rather go all, you know, let me go leave the room for five minutes and type up 10 jokes. 
Yeah, and it's funny because I know a lot of events, include myself, including myself included, that I'll get up, I'll get up with the puppet, I'll do something, I'll go, let me write that down. It, it doesn't work in reverse. You kind of you gotta throw it out there sometimes too. It's yep. you're exactly right that it is so personal. I want to switch gears again uh, because having somebody who has been in late night, which I have been fascinated with for many many years, something you touch on in the book is is Jay started. This, this thing about doing political jokes and getting our take, his take on the news and uh, getting these people, having these people, what they do, not who they are, but what they do made fun of. And it started all of this sort of political late night parody and satire. And now you say something very poignant, um, which is that now late night is becoming the source where we get our news. Mm-hmm. Is there a danger in getting our news from the Daily Shows, from the Colbert Reports, even from a late-night monologue at 11.30, uh, where we're, we're getting that biased satire with it? Um, here's what I think. I think that, that you know, people are smart enough that what, when I say getting the news, let, let me split it up. Mm-hmm. We're, we're getting the, what the topic is that is in the news a lot. People, you know, you know, 30 years ago, people would say, well, the nightly news is on. We have to go watch and find out what Tom Brokaw is saying. Well, you know, I think two things happen. One, you know, we realize we don't have to have a evening news doesn't have a, to be appointment television. Mm-hmm. Two, we can get it 24-7. And three, as we found out with Brian Williams, maybe our news anchors are not exactly the most, most truthful people we've ever met. Mm-hmm. So you go in the situation, and I think anyone who knows or is watching John Stewart, and I think he's fantastic, yeah. understand that John is 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 giving you his point of view. He's giving you a point of view, but the the fact and the premise remains the same. Remember, the premise, the setup, the fa- is always factual. It's based on a real story. So you're getting information that a Sarah Palin, you know was talking about foreign policy with Charles Gibson mm-hmm. and wasn't completely articulate in, ex- in explaining why she was qualified to be president. Yeah. Now, if you actually believe that she said, I can see Russia from my house, well, and that's what people believe, well, I, I, you know, I always say that's the joke. It's not the fact. You know, Tina Fey said, I can see Russia from my house, not Sarah Palin. Yeah, that's very well put. And another thing about Jay's comedy and comedy in general, late night comedy, is that Sometimes, as we found out in, uh, uh, I think, the period of 2009-2010, doesn't always work elsewhere. They tried to put Jay at 10 o'clock, and it, uh, the same kind of comedy just didn't work. Why do you think that is? You know, I, in looking back at that, that, you know, th- that was a bad decision by NBC for so many reasons. Yeah. Uh, and I think we came in, I, you know, I think... That, that primetime comedy, uh, people are not, you know, I think they're just not looking for it at, at 10 o'clock or at 9 o'clock. I think they're looking for more situational comedy. They're looking for more of their drama. And I think that people are kind of ingrained. They just, you know, we're used to seeing it at 11 or 1135, or, you know, if you're in the one time zone at 1035, we're used to it then. Mm-hmm. You've seen the local news. We're done for the day. Let's get our take on the news. So if you throw that in and, and the fact that they really wouldn't let uh, – NBC pretty much wanted to have us do a the same show yet different. Mm-hmm. So you, you people who were expecting the CJ did what he did with the Tonight Show were disappointed. People who didn't – who wanted to see something different than getting the monologue uh, at night were seeing, were seeing something they didn't like. When people were saying, no, let's just – We'll just watch it at 1135. And I just think we we were put in a situation where we weren't going to succeed. Here's the good news. It worked out for everybody in the end. You know, everyone's got a show. You know, now Jay's, you know, he's done. He's off doing stand-up, which he loves. And Mm -hmm. Jimmy Fallon's doing a fantastic job. Yeah, Jimmy Jimmy is is really bringing this viral aspect of it uh, into it, where he'll do something, and then the next day it's trending on Facebook because uh, they've put it up on YouTube. So mm-hmm. I really love to see what, what Jimmy is doing with it because, like I said, I've been obsessed with late night since I can remember. Yeah, uh, Jimmy has kind of redefined what late night is. I mean, if you're looking for a political monologue that Jay gave mm-hmm. you know, for years, you, I mean, you're not going to find that in Jimmy Fallon. That's not what he does. Mm-hmm. He's going to his strength, and it's, it's almost more of a variety and sketch show late night. Yeah. Um, 
if you know if you're looking for the the Lenos type monologue, and again, I've been wrong in every prediction in my life, Matt. But let me make one now. I'm going to bet that, that that that's what Colbert does when he comes on. I think it's going to be it's going to be a similar show. To, it's going to be almost like Letterman and Leno had a baby, and that's what Colbert show would be. That's fantastic. That's a really great insight, and I hope you're right. I really don't want to see Colbert move away. I want him to drop the character, but I don't want to see him move away from having a take on politics because that's exactly. what he's so and I known think you're going to see that. And again, by the way, I've been wrong in every prediction I've ever made about television my entire life. So we'll mark this down. We'll come back after Colbert comes on. You'll get me back on. Yeah. And I'll say, see, I was wrong again. <laughs> yeah. I Well, the question that that poses is, are are your sort of stalwart classic 1135 network television hosts moving away from, I'm sorry to our listeners, this is really getting into it, but um, moving away from politics, the humor of politics, because you have those options on Comedy Central, you have options to find very specified political humor. You know, I, I think it's just people go with their strength. I don't, you know, I think, you know, when you have Leno, who's, you know, a, one of the legendary stand-ups and a great monologuist, mm-hmm. That's what he's going to do. I think people just naturally gravitate towards their strengths. So I don't think anyone has that, well, we must move away from that. Mm-hmm. I think people are saying, what am I best at? And what, you know, and then, and will that appeal to the audience? I mean, in Fallon, his absolute, you know, it, it's what he does is in his wheelhouse, and it has great appeal. That's great. Um, by the way, I can't tell you what Stephen Colbert is really like. Yeah. Um, nobody can. <laughs> I, nobody can, and you know, I'm sure Mrs. Colbert can. But other than that, I have no idea other than my my prediction, which will be proven wrong. But I would love to see it. Yeah, I would too. Now you, we've been talking about late night, but you have written for so much else, so much cool stuff. Uh, the Academy Awards, Emmy Awards, Golden Globes. What there again? The same question, although not person to person, person to event. Uh, the difference between those things. Uh, uh, here's here's the main difference, and and that's and that's this: that a late night show needs to be topical. Mm-hmm. Uh, a special event show needs to be about that event. So let's take the Oscars. The hosts who have done the best, the Steve Martin's, obviously the Billy Crystal, I think the greatest Oscar host ever. The Chris Rocks, mm-hmm. the you know the, you know people like that. The Hugh Jackman, although he's not a, a joke teller, obviously, but he's very funny and entertain. You know, he's a five tool entertainer. I mm-hmm. uh, could do it all. But they make it about the event. It's about the movies. It's the Emmys. It should be about TV shows. Mm-hmm. The you know Golden Globes again is about movies and TV. Yeah. When it's those hosts do not work out well. It's when they either try to make it topical. Uh, again, you can put in a topical joke, but make it about you know it's the punchline to something about the movies. Yeah. Or they 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 forget that it's about the audience that is the Oscar audience in that audience, and they try to do their own type of show. Yeah, I think that's what Neil Patrick Harris's problem was. He was a fantastic entertainer. When he does the Tonys, he makes it about the Tonys. I, this time, you know, you're doing a magic trick. What does that have to do with the movies? Right. What does that have to do? And so, yes, it's something he loves and he's great at, but it's, it's not, you know, it's not what people want to see they you know this is a year this is about the movie industry the celebrities there and the movies themselves yeah that's i love it now before we get our last question i game a game i always like to play with guests best worst and biggest we're going to talk about the uh, best laugh you ever got i know in the book you say people try to go oh what's the favorite joke you've ever uh, written i don't want to do that is there a laugh that that sticks out to you as the the best or the biggest laugh that you've ever gotten mm-hmm. Uh, on any of the platforms that you've written, that you've... Yeah, it's, yeah I think, uh, for, first of all, let's just say, I, I am, because of a comedy writer, I'm much more likely to remember the 17,000 non-laughs uh. when there was nothing but dead silence. But uh, probably the two biggest laughs, um, mm-hmm. two of the biggest laughs I remember, let's go to the Oscars for a second, and, it, it, and one was with Steve Martin. It was in 2003, and uh, Michael Moore, uh, Steve was hosting the Oscars. Michael Moore was winning a bunch of, of uh, awards. You know, the Writers Guild Award, the Directors Guild Award, the this award. And we knew that at every show he would come out there and he would rip into President Bush. So we said, if he's going to win Best you know, Documentary, let's be prepared. 
So he came out there and he launched into this two-minute speech, ripping President Bush, ripping the war in Iraq. You know, it's an unconscionable war, President Bush. You're wrong, and, and rip it. And it was so, even though Hollywood was obviously a little bit of a liberal left-wing place, it was so over the top. People started to boo, and he got a lot of noise, and people upset. You could just tell, and it got nothing. Yeah. So Steve went out there, and right afterwards, and we wrote that right backstage with Steve, and he went out there and he goes, isn't that great? The Teamsters are helping Michael Moore to the trunk of his limo. <laughs> and the place exploded. Uh, and Steve, Steve walked back, and he just looked at us and just went, wow. The other moment, and I wish so much I had been part of this, but I wasn't. This was a Billy Crystal ad lit. This was in like 1991, 1992 in the Oscars. This was probably the biggest laugh I've ever seen, was... He, you know, he pointed out Hal Roach in the audience. Now, again, no one who's, who's listening to you, Matt, knows who Hal Roach is. He was a great silent film director. And he was 102 years old. And he stood up in the audience, if you really acknowledge him, which he shouldn't have been. It was just more of a, a shout out. Mm-hmm. And he started to talk and he wouldn't sit down. Well, of course, he wasn't mic'd. So he was talking for about 30 seconds. It's embarrassing. He's talking. No one can hear him. And then Billy just said, well, we can see why he started in silent film. <laughs> and just the place went nuts. That's brilliant. So, I mean, those are probably the biggest. The, 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 la- the, the non-laughs? Yeah. I mean, there's just too many, and it's too painful and traumatic. <laughs> oh, I won't go there then with you. That's, that's certainly not. I know my listeners, and they will kill me. They will absolutely kill me if I do not end with this question. We talked a lot about the examples of finding these things, and and you can see in the book uh, a lot of the jokes that you've written. You've you've put them down from all the hosts uh, and all late night um, and a lot of your stuff. But in your opinion, boil it down, what makes a killer joke? Um, What makes a killer joke is the following, to me. Succinctly, I hope I pronounce that right, stated the premise. It has to be about a topic we are interested in or that when we hear it, we become interested in. It has to have a twist. It has to have some something that the normal person wouldn't have thought about. And then, But the minute then they, they do, mm-hmm. they instantly take the side of what the comic is about to deliver. And then the punchline, which is either unexpected or taking it to an exaggerated level. You know, it, it, you know, I hate to dissect humor, mm-hmm. but to me, you know, the jokes that do the best, you know, work that way. If I had to make it completely simple, if I had to boil it down, surprise. Mm-hmm. Just, you know, you know, something that comes out completely as a surprise. So, you know, when and, and when you see Steve Martin come out there, he's coming out, you just expect he's going to introduce the next act. But when he says that, obviously he's showing he's in charge – it's more, you know, it's an ad lib thrown out. I mean, it's a written ad lib in one sense, mm-hmm. but it was a surprise. No one expected it, so that really worked. If you add that element in, you've got a classic joke. That is awesome. All right, John Max, you have a classic book on your hands. I cannot wait to see big, big things for this uh, for this book. You're also the author of four more, if I'm correct, four more books. Yeah, there's a number of other books that you know, they're, they're, as I call them, the other ones are. All fine, fine pieces of literature, and I'm, but I'm sorry, some trees died for them. Uh, you know that, but you know they're they're more what I call just you know they're parody books, whatever. This is I is one of I like them all, but this is one that I think really you know you know monologue you know what makes America laugh before bed really um, I think tells a story that I think is uh, I hope fun and interesting and a little entertaining for everyone who reads it. I know it will be. I know my listeners, and I knew as soon as I read it, I had to have you. Thank you so much for coming on the show. Appreciate it. Take care, man. Thank you so much. John, it was awesome talking to you. Thank you so much for your time. To purchase Monologue, What Makes America Laugh Before Bed, head over to Amazon.com or visit your favorite bookstore. And that's it for us this week, and that's it for us this season on Ventriloquism Weekly. But don't you fret, we will be back in June in a big way. This is what I was talking about last week. I was going to explain to you why we were coming back when we are. We will be coming to you live on tape from a location we haven't been to yet. So stay tuned for more information on that in the coming days. That's right. 
I can tell you that because of our not on location premiere, we will be returning June 22nd. Now, that's a little later in the month, but still only about a month away, if you can believe it. Month, five weeks, how much time flies. Until then, thank you so much for listening. A reminder, you can find all you need to know about Ventriloquism Weekly by going to our website, ventriloquismweekly.com. Reach out by emailing ventriloquismweekly at gmail.com and find our group on Facebook at facebook.com backslash T-A-L-K-F-O-R-T-W-O. Tweet at us and hashtag about us at or hashtag talk for two. From New York, signing off and thanking you so much for a great season of a lot of fun, great guests, and great listener interaction. I can't wait to come back next month. Signing off for Ventriloquism Weekly from New York, I'm Matt Bailey, reminding all you vents out there to keep talking for two. I will see you in June.